Welcome everyone to this edition of the GeoTop A seminar. We have the great pleasure of welcoming Yasuhiro Oke today to talk about characterizing rare events in persistent homology. Yasu? Okay, uh, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Yasu Hiroka from Kyoto. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer of this seminar series uh, for, giving my, for giving me the opportunity of this talk today. Uh, well, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, this title, Characterizing Rare Events in Persistent Homology. Uh, well, uh, let me first explain the motivation uh, why I am interested in rare events in persistent homology. So at this moment, uh, you may think that uh, rare events are not interesting objects to study. But uh, as I, I will explain soon, uh, characterizing rare events will be very important to make multi-parameter persistent homology easier to handle. All right. So here is the content of my talk. Uh, my final goal, my final goal is to understand multi-parameter persistent homology and make it easier to handle for practical data analysis. Well, uh, I have not yet achieved this goal at present, but uh, I will talk several ongoing works towards that goal today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to show a strong motivation from the practical data analysis in material science. And then I'd like to make the mathematical problem clear. Uh, here, uh, I will show how rare events appear in multi-parameter persistent homology in materials TDA. And uh, for this exposition, I need several mathematical formulations using quiver representation. So I will also give a brief review about some of the basics about quiver representations and uh, in particular, uh, commutative rather persistence uh, in this part. So in section one, I'd like to make clear the motivation of my mathematical work. And uh, our basic message here is that uh, although uh, multi-parameter persistent homology is extremely difficult to handle in purely algebraic setting, some geometric constraints of data, like point clouds in Euclidean space with noise, maybe reduce the algebraic complexity of multi-parameter persistent homology. So this is a basic question of mine. Then, uh, after formulating our mathematical, uh, <clears throat> after formulating, say, our mathematical target in representation theory way in section one. Uh, we next consider this problem in random topology way in section two. So for this purpose, I will first review my previous works about several limit theorems in one parameter persistence, namely uh, low large numbers, uh, central limit theorems uh, yeah, in one parameter setting. Then I will show some recent results about large deviation principle LDP of one, one parameter persistence diagram. So here, uh, roughly speaking, roughly speaking, the large deviation principle clarifies rare events in random variables, and these results are necessary to approach to our final goal. So I am interested in the rare event, so large deviation principle is will be important. And finally, I will show a low, uh, I will show a low large number in two parameter persistent homology which partially answered to our original questions. So this is the uh, uh, content of my talk today. Uh, all right, so let me explain the motivation of today's mathematical talk from materials TDA. So I have been, uh, well, recently, I have been recently working on materials TDA and then these are some of the examples and the projects uh, to which I have applied TDA so far. Uh, well, this is a glass project. This is a polymer and a protein project, and then this is a grain project. And uh, well, uh, through these researches, uh, we actually found that uh, persistent homology is a really powerful tool uh, to characterize hierarchical structures in complex materials like glass or polymers and then proteins. But uh, however, in these applications, 
uh, there are several or uh, many opportunities where we actually need multi-parameter persistent homology for more detailed characterizations of material structures. So uh, here, uh, in order to make clear this point, let me explain one of the representative works about material CDA here. Well, uh, this research is done and, uh, with a, collab a collaboration with these people, uh, published in 2016. And uh, well, since I had several occasions to explain this result uh, before, so some of you here may uh, already hear the content of this research. But um, in order to make clear my mathematical uh, motivation today, let me briefly explain the result uh, here. So in this research, we are interested in characterizing the geometric structures only appearing in a glass state. And uh, in this research, we focused on the material silica. This is consisting of the silicon atoms and the oxygen atoms. And uh, these three panels are showing the atomic configurations of the material silica in a crystal state, in a glass state, and a liquid state. It means that uh, each point here corresponds to the atom, silicon atom or oxygen atoms. Uh, then, uh, as you see, uh, it's easy to identify the crystal state because of its periodicity or regularities of the atomic configurations. So this is okay, but uh, on the other hand, it is not easy to distinguish between glass state and the liquid state from those atomic configurations by just looking at those con configurations. Both look just random, but uh, <clears throat> as you know, the glass is rigid material. So it means that it has to have some sufficient structures or sufficient geometric constraints in these atomic configurations in order to achieve the rigidity of the material. And this is a, a point I we would like to uh, understand. Uh, we somehow want to know the hidden geometric structures only embedded in a glass state, which is actually relating to the rigidity of the material. And to that goal, we applied the one-dimensional persistence to homology persistence diagram. So we focused on the ring structures embedded in these, state, uh, in these atomic configurations, and uh, here is the result. The persistence diagram of the, of the crystal consists of the isolated support of the diagram. On the other hand, the generators in a liquid state are spreading in a plane above diagonal. So it means that uh, any shapes of rings can be available in a sense. On the other hand, in crystal, crystal case, ring shapes are strict, very much uh, restricted. And interestingly, in the glass state, we can observe a curve like this. <clears throat> and uh, actually, by applying the so-called inverse analysis of the persistent homology, we found that the presence of these curves are really important to characterize the geometric structures of the glass state. <clears throat> well, I will not go into the detail about the inverse analysis, but uh, here, the message here is that uh, the presence of these curves, in particular this vertical curve, is extremely important to characterize the geometric structure of the glass. So this is a message of this uh, research. And uh, all right, so this is good. So now we understood the important geometric structures of the glass by using persistence diagram. But our next interest is to understand the robustness of those geometric structures with respect to perturbations. So as I said, since these vertical generators are very important to characterize the geometric structures of the glass, our next interest is the robustness of under the pressurization. It means that, uh, well, uh, it, may, it, it will be directly relating to the rigidity of the materials if we can uh, say something about the robustness and the pressure of these generators. So uh, we try to understand such a problem mathematically. So uh, for that purpose, we first constructed a new atomic configuration from the original one. 
by adding a pressure from the outside. So this is a uh, atomic new atomic configuration obtained by the pressurizations. And uh, this is a new persistence diagram of, of them, of, the, of, of it. So you may think these two seems very close, but uh, actually they are uh, slightly different because the atomic configuration is perturbed. And uh, our question here is that whether these two lines of generators are robust or uh, not. So it means that uh, may, may, it may be the case that uh, some of the generators here will be collapsed or broken by the effect of the perturbation or pressure and new generators may be appearing. So such a recombination may be possible, may be happening in the pressurization process, or some of the gen generators are actually uh, preserved or persist under the pressurization. So we are actually seeing the same generators here and then here. If it is a case, we can think that such a generator is robust. But if generators are collapsed once, once collapsed and then appear, new, new, new one is appearing, then we think that such a generator is uh, recombinated. So it is weak with respect to perturbation. So we want to somehow characterize and we want to somehow quantitatively estimate the robustness in this sense. And uh, so we focus on these li two lines of generators. And uh, here, these generators, we note that uh, these generators can be characterized by the burst time less than, say, R, and the death time greater than S. So <clears throat> it means that each, so uh, first of all, uh, in order to study these two generators, we consider the, this type of commutative diagram constructed by the check complex X for the left configuration. So here X alpha means the check complex of the left atomic configuration with uh, parameter R and S, and the Y is a check complex constructed by the right atomic configuration with parameter R and S. And then <coughs> since these generators can be characterized by the burst time less than R and the death time greater than S. It means that each generator can be expressed by the by this type of two length interval. Is it okay? So each generator has burst time less than R. It means that we have one vector space here. And the death time is greater than S. It means that we have we have we also have one vector space even here. So it means that each generator can be expressed by the length to interval on this part. So n here means the number of generators here in the green box. And similarly, all these generators can be expressed by the length to interval. So here k is a field coefficient. So it means one dimensional vector space here and the one dimensional vector space here with identity map. And we have m generators, say, in this green box. So now we can formulate these generators by the two-step intervals between uh, in the left and the right respectively. So our question about the robustness in the sense of the material science can be quantitatively studied uh, to check whether this generator and these two generators uh, can be matched on this commutative diagram, two by three commutative diagrams. So this is a mathematical formulation to study this robustness question. So in a sense, we need to study the persistence between left and then right in the sense of this commutative diagram. So uh, on the other, however, the, as you know, the conventional or classical uh, persistent homology theory cannot deal with this type of commutative diagram. So uh, we need several tools from the representation theory of the associative algebra. So let me now briefly review uh, some of those concepts uh, here. Although some of you may know, but now let me briefly review the necessary concepts 
from the associative algebra. So first, uh, let, first of all, let's recall the persistent homology and the persistence diagram. So this is just a, uh, just a very, very brief summary. So suppose we have a filtration of the topological space from x1 to xn, then persistent homology is defined by the series of the vector spaces given by the uh, homology vector space with field coefficients and the linear, linear maps between them induced from the inclusion map. So from the viewpoint of the quiver representation, it can be regarded as a representation on an type quiver. So then we have a nice property called the interval decomposition properties. So it means that um, under a mild condition, any persistent homology can be uniquely decomposed into the direct sum of the interval representations. This is coming from the Gabriel theorem. And then uh, from this unique decomposition, in particular, from the list of the births and deaths appearing in this decomposition, the persistence diagram is defined by the correction of those birth death pairs. So this is a, a standard uh, pipeline to obtain the persistence diagram. This is good. But uh, we need uh, more concepts to define persistence for the for this situation, for the persistence on this uh, commutative diagram. So uh, <clears throat> let me also uh, review some several concepts from the representation theory of associative algebra here. So first, uh, quiver Q is just a directed graph. It means that it is defined by the set of vertices and the set of arrows, like n type quiver or ladder type quiver. And then given a quiver Q, the path algebra KQ is defined, so here K is a field coefficient, and the path algebra is defined by a K vector space spanned by all passes appearing in your quiver Q, and where the product rule of two passes is given by their compositions. So this is a path algebra. And then associative algebra is also defined by a so-called relation, relation idea. So here relation law in a quiver is defined by a linear combination of passes with same source and the same sink. So important relation is a commutative relation, as you know. So it means that we identify this path, beta alpha, and then this path, delta gamma. So uh, quotient by this year ideal idea, uh, will define an associative algebra. In this algebra, we identify these two uh, passes. Okay, so then uh, we will define a representation M on the quiver Q, first of all, quiver Q. Uh, it is given by a series of vector spaces, so we assign assign a vector space on each vertex, and we assign a linear map for each arrow, like a persistent homology defined on an quiver. And similarly, a representation on the associative algebra uh, is defined by a representation on Q, but then the linear maps have to satisfy this condition. It means that the compositions along the uh, relation should vanish. So it means that the for instance, if you have this commutative relation, the composition of your linear map from this path and along this path should be equal. So this is a representation on the associative algebra. Quick review. Then, oh, okay. Uh, in the composable representation, M is defined as usual. It means that uh, if you have a uh, direct sum decomposition, then one of them should be zero as usual. And uh, we also have included Schmidt properties even in this setting. Oh, today I forgot to mention that uh, all representations uh, will be finite, dimensional one. So this is a quick review of the representation theory of associative algebra. And now we can define a multi-parameter persistent homology. So, well, uh, in general, uh, multi-parameter persistent homology is defined by a representation. So, it, for instance, if you have uh, two parameter filtrations of the topological spaces, then uh, we can take a homology functor, then we will get a representation on this quiver with full commutativities. 
So we have one direction AL quiver and the other direction of the AL quiver, and then we take a tensor product. And we consider a representation on it. It means that, uh, it, uh, it, yeah, and uh, this is a, a one way to define the two parameter persistent homology. So it's good. So we can define a two parameter persistent homology, but uh, its real difficulty is that uh, its decomposition theory is not understood well, and uh, it is regarded as a very difficult problem to have a decomposition theory of such a difficult algebra. But uh, as I explained, uh, developing the composition theory is very important for practical applications in TDA. So many mathematical researches are now ongoing. And uh, it is impossible to explain everything here. But uh, relating to my mo mathematical motivation today, coming from the material science, uh, let me recall one thing. So it is called a commutative ladder persistent homology. So in this setting, we don't deal with full generality of the two-parameter persistent homology, but we only consider the two-step persistent towards the vertical direction, like a ladder. And then in this setting, uh, we have applied the so-called Auslander writing theory uh, for, the, for developing the decomposition theory of this ladder type uh, persistence. And uh, even in this restrict setting, so ladder type setting, uh, we found that it is very useful in several practical applications. And uh, actually, uh, our original motivation to study robustness of the materials, glassy materials, can be formulated by the commutative ladder with length 3. 2 by 3, it means that we consider three length 3 ladders. So uh, by using the commutative ladder persistence, we can quantitatively study the robustness problem appearing in uh, material science. So, so let me briefly explain uh, that result and then going to the mathematical motivation. So here, let's focus on this type of uh, quiver, two by three associative algebra with full commutativity. And uh, usually, uh, representation theory with associative algebra, uh, we usually uh, list up all the indecomposable representations by the so-called AR quiver, Auslander Leighton quiver. So Auslander Leighton quiver of this type of associative algebra is described here, and uh, each vertex corresponds to the indecomposable representation in this associative algebra. And here, each vertex is ex so each vertex means an uh, indecomposable representation, so is expressed as dimension vector. It means that so here we have one, two, one, zero, one, zero vertex. It means that we have three one-dimensional vector spaces here, 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 and a two-dimensional vector space here, and zero otherwise. So this is a dimension vector expression. And now, uh, since we have all the list of indecomposables, we can define our persistence diagram even in this setting. Namely, given your persistent homology on this type of quiver, then we compute the direct sum decomposition into those intercomposables, and we assign those multiplicities on those vertices. So this is the persistent diagram. And actually, you can show that the classical persistence diagram uh, can be regarded as uh, this definition. So it means that uh, this is a, uh, uh, yeah, the same formulation of the persistence diagram in a conventional way, just using the Auslander and quiver. So let's compute the persistence diagram of this problem. So let's recall that we are interested in the robustness between these generators and these generators. Those are characterized by the length to intervals in the left and in the right. And we are interested in whether these two generators are matched between the left and the right. So our interested, our interesting in the composable representation is this. It means that left generator and the right generator are matched by a middle term. It is showing the robust generators under pressurization. So we would like to count the number of multiplicities corresponding to this in the composable representation from our persistence diagram. And here is a result. So this is a persistence diagram of this uh, real data. 
and our interest is on this vertex, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 1. So we want to count the number, and then the number is 2,304. So uh, in this way, we can quantitatively show the robustness of the materials by using the multi-parameter persistent homology. So this is one example to show how multi-parameter persistent homology is uh, important, so we can do more from the beyond the classical persistent homology. <clears throat> this is good. But uh, today, I'd like to focus on these two generators. So again, this is the AR quiver, so listing up all the indecomposables of the 2 by 3 uh, <clears throat> commutative ladder. And uh, previously, we focused on this vertex, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, since we are interested in the robust situation. But uh, here, uh, let's focus on these two pink generators, pink indecomposables. Uh, here, these indecomposables are called non-interval representations in a two-parameter sense, and all the others are classified as interval representations. We know that uh, only these two uh, generators have dimension two vector here. And uh, in the, yeah, in, in this result, so this is a persistence diagram computed on the real data. We see that uh, those multiplicities are very small, zero and then one, comparing to the others. And actually, at first, so actually, when I study the robustness property in the material science, I didn't care about this result since I focused on the multiplicity of this part. But then later, I started to care about the frequency of these non intervals in more general setting. So, uh, in order to check how frequent this observa observation is or how frequent these indecomposables are, we numerically generated many random point clouds in a Euclidean space and then computed those persistence diagrams as before. Then we observed interesting phenomena, numerically observed interesting phenomena. Uh, namely, no interval in the composables rarely appeared. So we have tested more than a million times, but no interval in the composable appeared in only once over zero. So these numerical experiments may imply the following question. And the random effect in the Euclidean space, do no intervals rarely appear in multi-parameter persistent homology? So this is the main motivation of my recent mathematical works. And to this question, my approach is to combine the probability theory, especially random topology, and representation theory I I explained so far. And then today, I will talk about several aspects relating to this question. And uh, well, here is the content of my remaining parts. Uh, before studying the two-parameter setting, the original motivation is coming from the two-parameter setting, but um, before that, I need to build a necessary framework in one-parameter case. So in part one, I will briefly review my previous work on limit theorems of persistence diagrams in one parameter case, the so large number and the central limit theorem. Then I will show our recent results about the large deviation principle in one parameter setting. Here, roughly speaking, large deviation principles enable us to study layer events of random variables. And finally, I will show some ongoing works on the law of large numbers for two parameter persistent homology which tell us a partial answer to this original question. So this is the motivation part of my talk today. And uh, well, in this talk, I planned to talk the motivation and the total story of my recent work carefully. So it took a relatively long time, but uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, uh, the motivation part. So from now on, I would like to move on to the second part of my talk uh, to, yeah, to this aim, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so from now on, let me explain several results about limit theorems in persistent homology. And uh, for the sake of simplicity, I focus on the cubical setting today, like this. 
And, uh, yeah, recall that our main interest is to study real events, like uh, no interval in decomposables. And for that purpose, I will explain several limit theorems, such as law of large numbers and the large division principle in this part. All right, so let me first explain our setting. <clears throat> I will study cubical sets, constructed uh, cubical sets in RD, uh, constructed by elementary cubes in the yeah, D-dimensional space. And here, elementary cube is defined by a product of intervals with unit lengths or length zero on the integer lattice. We define or well, we denote, yeah, we denote by KD the set of all elementary cubes in RD. And then our configuration space big omega is given by the product space of the unit interval over all elementary cubes. And so each configuration, small omega, is defined by assigning a value from 0 to 1 on each elementary cube, uh, like this uh, figure shows. So for instance, 0 0.7 is assigned to this two cell, 0 0.8 is assigned to this one cell, and so on. Then uh, we assign a probability measure on this configuration space. And today, uh, we simply consider a product measure. Under this preparation, our random cubical set is given for each omega, for each configuration and time t as the collection of all elementary cubes whose assigned values are less than or equal to t. So of course, the randomness on omega, randomness on omega will induce a randomness on the cubical set through this. Well, uh, from this definition, the random cubical set Xt will be an infinite set. And so we will introduce a finite cubical set by restricting the original cubical set into the window lambda n, by, like this. So window lambda n with length to n, like this. So since we now have a finiteness condition, we can naturally define the Betty numbers or yeah, Betty numbers uh, in this setting. And furthermore, uh, by changing the threshold time t, by changing this t, we naturally get the random filtration of cubical sets. Yeah, so this is our setting. So I'd like to emphasize that n in my talk here, n means a finite uh, restriction of our, of our original uh, cubical set or our uh, random filtrations. Let's record that. Then, under this setting, uh, first we can show the law of large numbers for beta numbers. Uh, let beta and q is the qth beta number of restricted cubical set, restricted by the window lambda n, as time t. So here, uh, well, uh, yeah, first, let me recall that n means the length of the window for the restriction. Then for each q and then time t, there exists a non-random constant, beta hat, such that our restricted beta number normalized by the volume of the window, so this is just a Lebesgue volume of the window, normalized by the volume, converges to this constant as n goes to infinity almost surely. So left-hand side is a random variable, but it goes to the non-random constant almost surely. So namely, this theorem clarifies the averaging behavior, averaging behavior of the bet numbers, and also shows that it shows that the volume of the window is an appropriate scaling factor to observe this limiting behavior. So this is the law of large numbers of the bet numbers. And uh, in today's talk, I will not use the following results, but uh, for reference, I just show that uh, the central limit theorem also holds in this setting. All right, so this is a low large number and the central limit theorem of the Betty numbers. And uh, here, uh, let me briefly, very briefly show the sketch of the proof of low large numbers of the Betty numbers. I hope that uh, it will help uh, your understanding ab about, uh, how to say, uh, 
uh, background of the not background. I hope it will help you understanding or to get some feeling to get some feeling about the low of large numbers about petty numbers. <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, this is uh, uh, convergence we want to prove. So normalized petty number will converge to some constant. This is what we want to show. And for that purpose, <clears throat> uh, let us set beta hat by this quantity. So expe expectation of the bet number normalized by the volume and take its pre uh, limit state. And uh, from now on, I will show that this is a correct constant to see this phenomenon. And for that purpose, let's take k and m by satisfying these two inequalities. This inequality just shows that uh, we are decomposing our original window lambda n by m grid with length 2k, like these figures. So we are decomposing our original window lambda n into smaller regions. Then let us set x and k at time t is given by the collection of elementary cubes q, whose assigned value is less than or equal to t as before. But here, elementary cube q is contained in some smaller region, smaller yellow regions. So in a sense, this is a dis disjoint union of the cubical sets in these yellow boxes. And let's take petty number of them. So in a sense, this is a summation of the small petty numbers coming from all yellow regions. Then uh, let's think about this difference. And by triangle inequality, we can upper bound by these three terms. And the first term will go to zero. Since in the first time, term, numerators are the same, but the denominators are the difference. But uh, these denominator, denominators will converge to the same value because of this, these inequalities. This is just a difference of the volume of the original window or some of the small uh, windows. So this will go to the same value when n goes to infinity. And the next term will also go to zero from this property. So it means that this property says that if you have two cubical sets, x and y, x is included in y, then the difference of the Betty numbers can be upper bounded by the difference of the number of cubical sets in them. And furthermore, this, this difference can be also upper bounded by the volume of the different set and some constant. So this is just an easy calculation. So then by using this uh, property, here in the second term, the denominators are the same, but the numerators are the difference, but we can upper bound by some constant. So it really goes to zero when n goes to infinity. And the third term, or the third term will also go to zero. This is from the so-called ergodic theorem. So in this proof, proof so this is a, a sketch of the proof, and uh, here I'd like to emphasize that the essence here is to decompose our original space into the smaller regions and then try to control the original Betty numbers by the sum of the smaller, small Betty numbers. So this is the original uh, essence, essence of the proof. And then this argument will be also applied in the last division principle later. Okay, so next. Uh, I'd like to talk about a low large number of the persistence diagram. And uh, well, uh, actually, by combining this result, the previous result uh, with random measure theory, we can generalize the large, uh, low large number of the Betty number into the low large numbers for persistence diagram. Uh, first of all, I regard a persistence diagram as a counting measure defined over the triangular region delta. The yeah, counting measure is just a sum of the Dirac measures. And uh, since we are dealing with a random filtration, our persistence diagram will be a random variable. So we will get a random counting measure. It means that uh, we, the persistence diagram is nothing but a random point process on this delta. So I will use this convention in my talk. And then uh, let's see 
be the point process on delta corresponding to the Q's persistence diagram of the random filtration Xn. So n again means the restriction by window lambda n. Then the, there exists a unique random measure nu on delta such that the restricted persistence diagram normalized by volume of the window converges to this random measure as n goes to infinity uh, almost surely. So this theorem shows the averaging behavior of the persistence diagrams with the volume as its scaling factor. So yeah, so this is the law of large number of the persistence diagram. And here is a sketch of the proof. The first item is already explained. So we regard persistence diagrams as random point process on delta. And the second, we extend the law of large number into the persistent Betty numbers. This is almost straightforward. And also, we generalize it into multiplicities on rectangular regions like this by taking alternating sums of the persistent Betty numbers shown here. Then, at this moment, we obtain an assignment of a value for each rectangular region on delta. So, what we have to do now is to explicitly construct a measure assigning or returning those uh, multiplicities on each rectangle. And to that purpose, we apply the random measure series, and then we can show that and we can actually explicitly construct a measure corresponding to new in the theorem. So this is the essence of the proof for the low range number of the persistence diagrams. So now uh, we know the averaging behavior of the persistence diagram. But uh, the main topic today is to study the layer event of the persistence diagrams. And uh, let me move on to that part. Well, uh, yeah, let us move on to our recent results about the large division principles. So this is a joint work with Kanazawa <coughs> and Miyanaga and Tsunoda. And uh, under the same settings so far, we can show that the Betty numbers satisfy the large division principle with the following great function i. Well, the rate function i looks very complicated, but of course, you don't need to remember it. But uh, there are several remarks. First, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> uh, now, uh, three fundamental theorems in probability theories, uh, namely low of large numbers, central limit theorem, and the large division principle are completed. And uh, as a result, various limiting behaviors can be now discussed including the layer events. In particular, by using this result, we can study layer events away from the average from this estimate. For instance, if you take A to be away from the average, then we can estimate the probability of uh, having such a layer event. It is controlled by the exponential decay with respect to this rate function. And uh, as a final remark, uh, we can also generalize uh, this result into persistent pet numbers and also multiplicities on rectangular regions in delta as before. All right, uh, so uh, here's a sketch of the proof of the Betty number, uh, sorry, here's a sketch of the proof of low, low, uh, large division principle of Betty numbers. <clears throat> Basically, we will apply the result by Sopalainen and Yukich, uh, published in 2001. And then they proved that, the, roughly speaking, they proved that the random variables will satisfy the reservation principles if you can check the three conditions called near additivity, regularity, and the uniform boundedness conditions. So we will check one by one. And here, let me remind you that the strategy to check those conditions are decomposing the original window lambda n into smaller regions, as discussed in the law of large numbers. So first, let us think about the near additivity. This condition is asking a kind of additivity of the Betty numbers by the sum of the Betty numbers from smaller regions, as we did before. And as before, let k be chosen like this. Then the difference of the Betty numbers between the big region and the sum of the small region can be upper bounded by the 
number of cubical sets as before. And then this upper bound is obtained by, yeah, the same argument and then, then very simple estimate shows that by taking the quotient of by the volume of the window, uh, this difference uh, will converge to zero. And this guarantees a near additivity. Uh, next, let us think about the regularity condition. So now let, let M be chosen by this, like the similar situation. Then this condition is asking the convergence of these two Betty numbers, total Betty numbers and the slightly shrinked Betty numbers. And uh, we can also show that uh, this difference divided by the volume goes to zero by the almost the same argument. And finally, let us consider the uniform boundedness, boundedness on log moment generating function. Our target here is to show the uniform boundedness of this value, but again, by upper bounding this Betty number by the number of cubical sets, we can easily show its boundedness. So this is a sketch of the proof for the large division principle of the Betty numbers. And uh, then, as before, we can generalize this result on the setting of the persistence diagrams, and this is the main result of my talk today. Uh, namely, the normalized persistence diagrams satisfy the large division principle with a rate function h defined by this form. Well, uh, before going into the detail, I'd like to emphasize here that we can now study layer events characterized by persistence diagram from this result. And here, this psi, <coughs> psi is a bijection between a projective limit space, projective limit space uh, of rectangular measures and the set of finite Borel measures. And then J is a rate function on this projective limit space. Well, uh, first, uh, as this formulation implies, this main result is obtained in such a way that first, we prove the large division principle for this projective limit space, and then transfer the result into our original, our interesting space M. So this is a strategy. So let me first explain about the projective limit space appearing here. What kind of projective limit I'm thinking? So here, uh, for each L, we consider a grid decomposition of our support of the persistence diagram or delta. So we consider a grid decomposition of delta like this for each L with length 1 over 2 to the L. And uh, let VL be a finite dimensional vector space spanned by Lebesgue measures on these grids. For each L. Then uh, from L to L plus 1 to L, we define a linear map by this, namely flattening the measure on the pink to that on the green, containing that pink grid. So since we have four grid in this green, uh, we have this constant. But basically, this is just a flattening the original uh, measure into the bigger one. So we can easily see that uh, this defines a projective limit of the measures. And now I can explain a sketch of the proof for the LDP of the persistence diagrams. First, we show LDP, the division principle for each DL, by applying the LDP for rectangles. This is just a straightforward argument since this is just a finite dimensional vector space. Then the LDP for each VL can be lifted to the LDP for the projective limit space by applying the dawson gartner theorem. This is an important theorem. However, this projective limit space is too large comparing to the Radon measure, which was obtained as a limit object of the law of large numbers for persistence diagram. Therefore, by restricting this projective limit space to V infinity plus, this appeared in our statement 
this is a project image space button. We assign some restrictions. Then uh, we will have a bijective correspondence between our interesting uh, Borel measures. So then we can induce the LDP to this setting from the LDP of the project limit, limit space. So this is a sketch of the proof for LDP of persistent diagram. All right, so this is the final slide of my talk. And uh, let me briefly explain an ongoing work with uh, my student, Shimizu. Uh, here, I go back to the original motivation explained at the beginning of my talk. <clears throat> As I mentioned, some computational experiments about commutative radar persistence based on random point processes implied that non-interval indecomposables rarely appeared. I'm interested in this phenomena, and uh, we obtained the following results so far. Uh, first, uh, we can show the low large number for each in the composables, even in this setting. Here, di means the multiplicity of the indecomposable i appearing in the given representation. Here, l means the length of the window. So we have a low branch number as before, even in two parameter setting. And then this part can be done by almost similar arguments explained today. But I'd like to emphasize, I would like to emphasize that we can also show this final line. Namely, limiting multiplicities for non-intervals will vanish in subcritical regime. Here, yeah, I will skip the def uh, precise definition of the subcriticality of the point process, but it roughly says that point process is very sparse. Well, here, uh, at this moment, yeah, at this moment, I cannot remove the assumption of the subcriticality of the point process on, uh, yeah, to this statement. But uh, at least in the subcritical regime, this result positively explains the previous numerical observations. So in the large scale limit, we cannot observe the non-interval intercomposables in the subcritical regime. Or conversely speaking, it implies the significance of the concept of interval decompositions even in the two-parameter setting. Well, I need to remark that these results depend on our geometric setting given by point clouds in a Euclidean space. And of course, I'm not saying, I'm not saying a similar statement for any representations of multi-parameter persistence in purely algebraic sense. However, this result suggests that under suitable geometric setting, the algebraic structure may be simplified and the interval decompositions may be one candidate even in multi-parameter setting. Well, as I mentioned, at this moment, I cannot remove the subcriticality condition, and also I have not yet studied the layer event in the sense of the large deviation principle for the commutative radar persistence. So those further generalizations and uh, researches uh, will be uh, well ongoing work uh, with my students and uh, collaborators. Okay, uh, this is the end of my talk today. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayasu. Okay, the, are there any questions? I have a question. Hello. Can Hello. you hear me? Yes, Hello, hi. So I think I missed um, a, a part of your talk in the um, in, in the last part because it was all scrambled the the audio at least uh, from my side I don't know if others had this problem but anyway <laughs> I was I was mostly interested in the first part when you studied the the um, um, robustness of your persistent diagram against perturbations yeah exactly. So have you have you checked uh, also the perturbation against the dynamics? So how robust is in the in the dynamics of of this uh, of the glass? Well, how do you mean the dynamics? 
it means so you mean that not only adding small perturbation but also we need to consider more long time uh, effect of the perturbation or something like that or also for instance correlations correlations in the persistent diagram due to dynamics so when, when if you evolve the dynamics of the system do you do you see signatures of, uh, uh, of correlated uh, yeah yeah, it looks very interesting. Uh, I think it looks very interesting, but uh, I have not yet uh, checked that. Okay, okay. Mm, very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? If not, I have a question, Yasu. So your theoretical results are related to uh, point processes on cubical complexes, right? That's the framework in which uh, you established. Uh, that part, I, I have to apologize that, and that part may mislead you. Uh, today, I mainly focused on the cubical setting, mm -hmm. but uh, this simulation is done by the point process. That's okay. uh, actually uh, spreading the point and then uh, constructing the check complexes. So statement is a bit different. A setting okay. is a bit different, sorry. But uh, basically, we can show the same results. Okay, so it's, it, you have re similar results outside of the cubical context then? Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good, very nice. It's nice to see, almost, it's almost surprising that you have this, uh, this uh, relationship between the, the Betty numbers on the, the pieces and then the, on the whole thing. Very interesting. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, then I would like to thank Yasu very much for a really interesting talk with uh, lots of deep mathematics with uh, very um, significant applications as well. Thank you also for having given this talk so late at night in Japan. It's <laughs> and, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. And uh, thank you all for joining and attending the talk. Uh, the recording will be available online. And uh, look forward to seeing you at the next GeoTop seminar.